virtual gavel being banned. Um, the subcommittee on Asia, the Pacific, Central Asia, and nonproliferation will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any point, and all members will have five days to submit statements, extraneous material, and questions for the record, subject to the length limitation in the rules. To insert something into the record, please have your staff email the previously mentioned address or contact full committee staff. Please keep your video function on at all times, even when you're not recognized by the chair. Members are responsible for muting and unmuting themselves, and please remember to mute yourself after you finish speaking. Consistent with remote committee proceedings of HRES 8, staff will only mute members and witnesses as appropriate when they are not under recognition to eliminate background noise. I see that we have a quorum and will now recognize myself for opening remarks. First, I wanna thank our witnesses for joining us today on this hearing focused on strengthening U.S. ties with Southeast Asia. Home to more than 662 million people and with a combined GDP of 3.2 trillion, the economic promise and strategic importance of Southeast Asia are hard to overstate. I commend the Biden administration for its continued prioritization of the region and the high level visits from officials since the administration came into office just nine months ago. And today with this hearing, I want to make sure there are no doubts about the U.S. government's and Congress's continued commitment to our Southeast Asian friends. The region's economic vibrancy, strategic location at the center of the world's maritime commerce and demographic diversity are vitally, vitally all make Southeast Asia a place of critical importance for the United States. I look forward to discussing existing areas of cooperation and where we can expand the U.S. Southeast Asia partnership. As we hear from many of our allies and partners in Southeast Asia, what makes the region um, tick is the global commerce that courses through it. But many in the Southeast Asia region face challenges in maintaining economic independence. And as close friends and partners, we must continue to develop support for Southeast Asian nations in developing diverse sources of investment and export markets so that they can stand up to any economic coercion. I was one of 28 House Democrats to vote for trade promotion authority in 2015 and supported and continue to support and hold out hope um, one day for U.S. participation in the TPP or what is now called CPTPP. The United States should continue to lead in the region and think creatively on how to further integrate economically with Southeast Asia. This would include expanded digital infrastructure and connectivity across the region and setting the foundations for digital trade agreements that would harness Southeast Asia's immense potential. As a region dominated by the world's largest ocean, ensuring waterways remain free and open is a critical matter. Some countries seek to undermine maritime sovereignty through bullying and intimidation, and by using gray zone tactics that intentionally blur the line between military and commercial naval activity. To be clear, there have long been maritime territorial disputes in the South China Sea, but the best way and safest way to resolve those disputes is by ensuring all countries abide by international laws and norms aimed at resolving them. We must continue to reinforce those norms with our allies and partners. The United States has worked closely with regional actors to spotlight these challenges, and I particularly commend the Filipino Coast Guard for publishing photos earlier this year that clearly showed what the PRC has been up to near Woodson Reef. Our subcommittee also did a joint hearing with the House Armed Services Committee, Sea Power Subcommittee, on this important issue in April. And I will continue to work with our regional partners to defend the security in this vital region. The importance of Southeast Asia extends beyond the traditional security challenges and promises and promise of mutual economic prosperity that have been pillars of the US relationship in the region. There are opportunities for broader cooperation and partnerships between the United States and Southeast Asian countries to address some of the most pressing threats today, including combating climate change, promoting global health security, and increasing supply chain resiliency. 
and you know, President Biden's team has clearly seen this as well, and as evidenced by the, the concrete deliverables from high level engagements. Obviously, the partnership between our countries um, are not, is not without challenges. We do not always see eye to eye on every issue, but what unites us, including our shared commitment to promoting a free, open, inclusive, and prosperous Indo Pacific, is far greater than what separates us. Just last week, the Senate confirmed Daniel Crittenbrink, another former ambassador to Vietnam, to be the Assistant Secretary of State for the Bureau of East Asian and Pacific Affairs. This committee looks forward to working with them to continue deepening U.S. engagement and ties with Southeast Asia. And I'm confident the insights that our witnesses will share today will further shed light on opportunities for the United States to do just that. So again, um, I want to thank my good friend, um, the ranking member, Mr. Shabbat, for his partnership and, and understanding of the importance of the region. And with that, let me yield five minutes to my friend from Ohio, the ranking member, Representative Steve Shabbat. Thank you, Chairman Barra, for holding this hearing today. I really appreciate it. And I want to thank uh, the panel as well for joining us today. As the former chair of this subcommittee and the co-chair of the U.S.-Philippine Friendship uh, Caucus, uh, along with my uh, good friend Bobby Scott, as well as the Cambodia Caucus, uh, I, uh, I always appreciate giving Southeast Asia the time and attention that it deserves. Uh, Mr. Chairman, as those of us who have spent years engaging with the Indo-Pacific know all too well, the relationships we share with this critical region are too often overlooked in the foreign policy chatter inside the Beltway here. Um, this is especially true today uh, as America has woken up to the reality that we're in a period of great power competition. This reality is sharpening some paradoxical challenges to formulating an effective U.S. policy towards the Association of Southeast Asian Nations and its 10 member states. On the one hand, the United States and like-minded allies and partners are aggressively building an array of new plural lateral uh, groups like the Quad and the AUKUS, uh, which are essential uh, to mitigate threats to the Indo-Pacific. On the other hand, ASEAN centrality is and will remain a fundamental principle of the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy. A similar difficulty is that ASEAN nations seek relationships that are meaningful in their own right and justifiably resist being made into appendages or pawns of great power maneuvering. But the most important issues for us to address with our ASEAN partners are those stemming from great power competition, from trade rules to sea lanes and even the sanctity of their own sovereign territory. Likewise, ASEAN is essential to the future of the Indo-Pacific and possibly the only practical multilateral structure for nations with such disparate cultures, languages, religions, governments, and population sizes. But the troubling reality is that ASEAN often proves incapable of addressing crises. Every year, the world waits with bated breath to see whether the ASEAN leader's statement will even mention the fact that the PRC is stealing its members' territory. And the January coup by Burma's military has once again thrown the limitations of ASEAN into sharp relief. Resolving these paradoxes will require following through on the increased engagement in the Indo-Pacific that the United States has promised over successive administrations and has so far never fully delivered on. Over the last decade, the United States has concluded that the Indo-Pacific is our prevailing foreign policy priority. But the relative foreign assistance resources dedicated to this half of the globe have barely shifted and are still far outstripped by those dedicated to the Middle East, Africa, and the Western Hemisphere. We also need to do better to resolve the dissonance between the perception of U.S. disinterest and the reality of our partnership. The fact is the United States remains ASEAN's most reliable and essential external partner. In addition to our bilateral assistance, the United States uh, is, for example, the world's largest donor to COVAX. We're also the world's largest donor to the Rohingya crisis and Southeast Asia's primary source of foreign direct investment. And, for, and far too often, uh, American sailors and airmen are the only people standing in the way of the PRC's constant attempts 
a territorial expansion. Going forward, it will be essential to articulate a compelling vision of what U.S. partnership offers to the nations of ASEAN. Successive U.S. administrations have struggled to offer a credible theory of economic engagement with the region. And exploring new bilateral or sectoral agreements uh, could help. Following through on our pandemic era emergency assistance to create lasting public health cooperation could be another promising opportunity. And along with our partners, we must demonstrate that arrangements like the Quad and AUKUS will not diminish ASEAN, but elevate it and protect its members from the PRC's attempts of regional, regional hegemony. With that in mind, I'm looking forward to discussing the Biden administration's recent high-level trips to the region and in reviewing their new version of the Indo-Pacific strategy when it comes out, which I hope will address these challenges and opportunities. The in-person engagement we've seen from the cabinet and the vice president so far this year is certainly something that our ASEAN partners will appreciate. So I look forward to continuing the conversation with our panelists and I yield back. Thank you, um, ranking member. Let me now introduce um, our witnesses. First, we have the Honorable David Shear, adjunct professor at the John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. He was U.S. ambassador to Vietnam from 2011 to 2014, after which he served as Assistant Secretary of Defense for Asian and Pacific Security Affairs from 2014 to 2016. Next, we have Ms. Meredith Miller, former Deputy Director of the Office of Economic Policy at the State Department Bureau of East Asian and Pacific Affairs. Last um, but not least is, is Mr. Michael Sobolik, Fellow in Indo-Pacific Studies at the American Foreign Policy Council. I thank you all for participating in today's hearing. I will now recognize each witness for five minutes. Without objection, your prepared written statements will be made part of the record. I will first invite Ambassador Scher to share his testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Shabbat, thanks for inviting me to appear before the subcommittee today. I'll be sub summarizing remarks that I've already submitted. 30 years from now, Southeast Asia will be a fulcrum of world geoeconomic and geopolitical power. Countries most engaged economically in the region will write its rules and set its standards. Countries that wield effective influence, particularly with countries bordering the South China Sea, will hold tickets to regional eminence. To be a player in the future Southeast Asia, Right now, the United States will need to engage the region with a positive message that appeals directly to Southeast Asian aspirations. We'll need to conduct a vigorous regional diplomacy from the presidential level down. We'll need to devise a region-wide economic strategy, including support for infrastructure finance. We'll need to deploy our military assets in ways that better deter aggression and best fit regional strategic realities and we'll have to increase pressure on the Burmese military regime and continue to seek improvements in democracy and human rights throughout the region. Southeast Asians want economic development, national autonomy, and a peaceful international environment. Our message should appeal to these aspirations. ASEAN leaders seek a regional balance of power that permits them maximum maneuverability. They know that they can't pursue these goals effectively without strong American regional engagement. They also know that they can't succeed if they're tied too tightly either to the U.S. or to China. ASEAN peoples are deeply ambivalent about the rise of Chinese influence. On one hand, their interests compel them to pursue the big economic opportunities that China offers. On the other hand, the ASEANs chafe at Chinese diplomatic high-handedness and fear Chinese economic domination. They can exploit this ambivalence, but only to a point. We can exploit this ambivalence but only to a point. ASEAN countries don't want to be considered me merely as pawns in a Sino-American struggle for regional influence. Mr. Chairman, doing diplomacy with Southeast Asia is like eating tofu with chopsticks. If you squeeze too firmly, it falls apart. If you squeeze too softly, it slips away. But we have to squeeze. If we're going to do serious diplomacy with the Southeast Asians, we need American ambassadors at post. We still don't have ambassadors in multiple Asian capitals. 
Every day without an ambassador at post is a day of op opportunities lost to American interests. We also should engage more fully in the region at the presidential level. For the president to show up consistently in Southeast Asia is important, but even more important is the need for sustained presidential attention to the task of shifting resources necessary to make Southeast Asia a higher strategic priority. The administration came out of the gate strongly with su successful visits by the Vice President, Secretary of Defense Austin, and Deputy Secretary of State Sherman. The two quad summits hosted by the President aggressively addressed the fight against COVID, climate change, cybersecurity, technology cooperation, and people-to-people -people relations. This kind of effort appeals directly to regional aspirations. Members of Congress can demonstrate our interest in the region by visiting. You'll find our hosts eager to engage, and you'll find uh, embassies eager to host you as well. We haven't had a Southeast Asian economic policy since 2016. From a strictly strategic point of view, our failure to join the Trans-Pacific Partnership was a blunder, and we should fix it by rejoining. We should also participate more fully in the Southeast Asian infrastructure build-out. We need to focus on infrastructure finance, local capacity building, and, and pro, uh, project preparation. Increased funding earmarked for Southeast Asia for the Development Finance Corporation, the Treasury Department's Infrastructure Transaction Assistant ne Assistance Network, and the Trade Development Administration would go a long way. With regard to defense, str strengthening conventional deterrence in Southeast Asia is a critical task. We must increase joint force lethality, enhance our posture, and strengthen allies and partners, and we'll need to sh shift resources from other regions in East Asia in order to do so. The establishment of AUKUS sent the entire region a strong message of American commitment. And with regard to shifting uh, uh, resources, um, we need to look at not only uh, our, our forces, but at the way in which we distribute uh, security assistance globally. With, with regard to human rights, the tragic situation in Burma reflects some of the hard choices and limited options that U.S. policymakers sometimes face in engaging Southeast Asia. We must keep up the pressure on the regime while we do all that we can to stay on the side of the Burmese people. We should appoint a new special representative and policy coordinator for Burma. The position in the State Department has been vacant since 2012. We need to expand sanctions on trade and investment with entities owned or controlled by the military regime. And we need to seri seriously consider declaring the military's 2017 actions in Rakhine State uh, genocide. Ambassador Sheriff, we look, your, your time has expired, unfortunately, but we look forward to you know, expanding on your opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I was almost done. Okay. Great. Let, let me now go ahead and um, recognize Ms. Miller for her testimony. Thank you, Chairman Barron, uh, Ranking Member Shabbat, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to share my perspective with you on this important topic, strengthening Southeast Asia-U.S. relations, um, particularly the economic dimension of that. Um, the importance of that cannot be understated and in many respects is foundational to the topic of today's hearing. Um, this is for a number of, of factors that are interrelated. First, as I detailed in my written testimony, Southeast Asia is of tremendous economic importance to the United States and there is tremendous potential for future growth. Second, uh, as Chairman Barra and Ranking Member Shabat noted in their opening remarks, China's economic uh, investment influence in Southeast Asia uh, is longstanding and is, an on, is on an upward trajectory. It is in the interest of the United States to support our partners in the region in having diversified economic relationships that allow for resilience against external shocks as well as strategic autonomy. This desire in uh, Southeast Asia for economic uh, diversity and relationships is also driving many new negotiations of preferential trading arrangements. Uh, CPTPP is one. ASEAN is also the, the leader behind uh, the new uh, RCEP agreement, uh, which is the largest FTA in the world and is actively negotiating an FTA with the European Union. 
Um, the U.S. is not a party to any of these new frameworks, um, and this disadvantages our companies uh, over the medium and long term in particular, and also the United States as a destination for foreign direct investment. It also means that our voice uh, at the table in developing new standards and norms in the region is weaker than it was before. It's also symbolically important. Um, many in the region are concerned that the U.S. has ceded leadership to China in this important economic arena. And earlier this month, China announced that it had formally applied to join CPTPP, reinforcing this narrative in certain quarters. Additionally, and perhaps really importantly for the topic of the hearing, uh, Southeast Asians overwhelmingly want more economic engagement from the United States. Uh, economic engagement, commercial diplomacy is at the heart of multilateralism in the region. It is the center of the mission of APEC and also core to the foundation uh, and the activities of ASEAN. For leaders in emerging economies in the region right now, in particular, all of these issues have been thrown into even more uh, acute relief by the devastation of COVID-19. The economic health and social consequences of the pandemic have put additional urgency on leaders to find new ways to stimulate economic growth uh, and provide jobs, particularly for the very young population of the region. The Biden administration has greatly enhanced its outreach to Southeast Asia in the second half of the year, which is a very welcome development. And uh, Secretary of State Tony Blinken has announced that the administration will shoot, soon share an Indo-Pacific strategy. Um, we can be fully confident that Southeast Asian leaders will be looking to that strategy in particular for the economic dimension. And for it to be successful, we need to be responsive and engaged on that concern. In my written testimony, I included uh, several recommendations for the committee's consideration on how we can boost our economic engagement in the region. Perhaps the most important and also the most challenging is for the U.S. to chart a path forward for joining CPTPP. There is no substitute for the United States in both strategic and economic importance for participating in that agreement um, as a way of ensuring our long-term competitive outlook uh, and uh, helping to provide additional developments of high standards in areas like labor, climate change, and other concerns for the United States. Uh, it's also welcome to hear growing momentum for sectoral uh, agreement negotiations, particularly in the digital policy arena. Uh, Southeast Asia is one of the fastest growing uh, internet economies in the world in a large digital market. Uh, third, it's important to note that the United States has many uh, strong existing frameworks for economic diplomacy uh, in the region, but these could be usefully strengthened for enhanced impact. Um, this includes uh, resourcing our agencies that help to promote trade and investment, uh, like the DFC uh, and TDA, uh, revitalizing our trade and investment framework agreement dialogues with ASEAN and bilaterally with key countries in the region, and uh, pursuing uh, Vice President Harris's welcome announcement that the U.S. would seek to host APEC in 2023. Um, importantly, uh, Southeast Asia is also looking to the United States, and we can play a very important role in supporting the region in charting uh, a path forward for equitable economic recovery from COVID-19. The devastation of the pandemic has hit vulnerable, vulnerable groups particularly hard, including women, the youth, and the poor. In the interest of time, I will stop my, my remarks here. And I very much look forward um, to continuing the discussion with the distinguished members of the committee. Great. Thanks, Ms. Miller. And now let me recognize uh, Mr. Sobelwick for his testimony. Thank you, Chairman Barra. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Shabbat, distinguished members of the subcommittee, it is a privilege for me to appear before you today to discuss strengthening America's ties with Southeast Asian nations. The historical arc of U.S. policy in the region has given these governments ample reason to question America's reliability, commitments, and staying power. Their fears, moreover, have been made more acute in recent weeks by the precipitous U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. 
and by a muting of the Biden administration's early clarity about the need for long-term strategic competition with the People's Republic of China. When it comes to appreciating Asian perceptions of America's role in Southeast Asia specifically, three case studies merit examination. The first is America's withdrawal from Vietnam in the 1970s. When the United States abruptly pulled out of Vietnam in 1975, ASEAN nations were shocked not that America had left, but the way in which it did so. America's bungled, uh, bungled withdrawal led to hedging behavior by regional states. Uh, a year prior to the pullout, Malaysia established relations with China after Saigon's fall, the Vietnam, uh, excuse me, the Philippines followed suit and Thailand reached a similar calculation shortly thereafter, normalizing relations with Beijing in a bid to have China's help to blunt Vietnam's advance into Southeast Asia. The second episode of note was Washington's response to the Asian financial crisis in 1997. That year, currency values in Thailand and Indonesia tanked and regional growth halted. Washington, however, did not lend a helping hand to Thailand, despite having given Mexico similar aid under similar conditions in 1994. China, however, pledged financing and economic support to Bangkok. It was only after the situation in Southeast Asia worsened and the risk of contagion grew that the U.S. supported an Indonesian bailout fund. ASEAN member states, however, received the message clearly. The United States was an unpredictable partner in a crisis, perhaps even an unreliable one. The final episode revolves around America's passivity in response to the PRC's reclamation and militarization of the South China Sea in the 2010s. Beijing's fait accompli land reclamation presented serious problems to Vietnam, Malaysia, and the Philippines, as well as Taiwan. While diplomats attempted to address the issue within ASEAN, Beijing exploited its close ties with Cambodia to scuttle any inclusion of the South China Sea in the resulting communique. Although subsequent U.S. freedom of navigation operations communicated our resolve to sail and patrol wherever necessary, China had succeeded in creating new facts on the ground that severely complicated the economic and military calculations of key ASEAN member states. This background in turn casts recent events in Afghanistan in a new and concerning light, both for Washington and especially for ASEAN. To the misfortune of Southeast Asian nations, Washington is doing now what it did 40 years ago when it exited Vietnam. The U.S. has once again haphazardly ended a war on the other side of the world and is relying on others, especially China, to pick up the pieces. This time, however, China is not an economic backwater or a military afterthought. It is the world's second largest economy, by some estimates the largest, and has the region's largest and most capable armed forces. There are, however, encouraging signs that Washington is beginning to learn from these mistakes from the widely supported free and open Indo-Pacific concept to the commendable Mekong-U.S. partnership that was recently established. Looking forward, policymakers would do well to give attention to four matters. I go into these in detail in my submitted testimony. I'll briefly touch on them now. The first is acknowledging this spotty record and committing uh, in conversations with our partners in the region uh, to learn from them. Secondly, is to not performatively, but substantively engage in high level officials, which my uh, other uh, colleagues have talked about here in the administration has done well thus far. The third is when appropriate to integrate our partners in ASEAN into Quad and AUKUS activities uh, publicly and privately. Finally, and I'll stop here given time, uh, is to work with our partners uh, to identify and respond to the partners inside of ASEAN that China exploits to its own benefit. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Shabalek. Um, I will now recognize members for five minutes each and pursuant to House rules, all time yielded is for the purposes of questioning our witnesses. Because of the virtual format of this hearing, I will recognize members by committee seniority alternating 
between Democrats and Republicans. If you miss your turn, please let our staff know and we will circle back to you. If you seek recognition, you must unmute your microphone and address the chair verbally. I will start by recognizing myself in five minutes. Ms. Miller, you talked um, a bit about the importance of economic engagement and you know, certainly as a supporter of TPP, you know, I, I do recognize the strategic funder. That was much more a tool of both economic engagement, but also geopolitical strategy. Maybe you can comment on, you know, I, I think it may be a, a road too far at this particular moment in time in getting back into CPTPP. But, um, you know, this is something that, you know, certainly I've talked to the ranking member about, and I, I do think there is some will in, in Congress in a bipartisan way and a bicameral way especially if you look at the, the strong bipartisan vote on USMCA, where you actually had more Democrats in the House voting for that deal, 196 Democrats, I believe 193 Republicans. So there are opportunities to, to build on um, something. The one area where we have focused a little bit at the subcommittee level is on the digital trade arena. You know, certainly partners in the region, um, Singapore, you know, New Zealand, others have have trade deals. You know, if you take the digital trade chapter out of USMCA, there's a strong starting point there. If you look at the Trump administration executive actions in a bilateral way with Japan, there's a starting point there. So it's not as though we have to start from scratch. Maybe you can comment on you know, if that's the right starting point. You know, there may be some opening with the, the administration, you know, if you listen to some of the comments of the, the uh, of Ambassador Tai, as well as the administration, um, there might be some opportunities there. And that's something that I think we're thinking about as a subcommittee, potentially you're know, taking a lead and sending a signal in a bipartisan way to the administration. So your thoughts on digital, right? Thank you very much, Chairman Barra, for raising that important issue and also important opportunity for the United States. Um, there does seem to be good momentum building for exploring a, a digital trade agreement in the Indo-Pacific, um, both among key stakeholders in the United States and also in the region. Um, one, I think, particularly useful example to look at, in addition to building on um, the, the good provisions in the USMCA and the Japan-US agreement, is the recently uh, it concluded Digital Economic Partnership Agreement, which was announced by New Zealand, Singapore, and Chile um, as an agreement to help establish norms to facilitate trade, but also it has a particular emphasis on uh, digital inclusion, SMEs, um, and was negotiated by smaller economies. Um, looking through the prism of engagement with ASEAN, I think DIPA is a very useful model um, for the administration to consider engaging with going forward. Um, it also has a, a modular approach to certain provisions, so uh, countries can um, bite off uh, pieces of the agreement at, at a particular time, which might make it more digestible um, and a stronger platform for engaging some of the less developed uh, ASEAN economies. Um, it's worth noting in the context of our conversation about China that China has also expressed interest quite recently um, in uh, potentially in joining DIPA. And it is an area where I think it's important for the U.S. to demonstrate some leadership, particularly while we um, navigate our path forward on CPTPP, which you know, Chairman Barra, will be a difficult and probably long um, but very important process. Great. Well Maybe Ambassador Shear, I could ask ask you a question. Um, staying on the the topic of economic engagement in the region, one area we've had conversation with um, the Indonesians, with the Vietnamese, and and others in the region is supply chain redundancy and resiliency. Yeah, and, and we've talked to our Quad partners as well about strategically investing in the supply chain resiliency. Your thoughts on how important that would be in, you know, in doing that in a strategic way? I think it's extremely important. Supply chains have been moving to Southeast Asia, particularly places like Vietnam and Indonesia for some time. This trend accelerated with the COVID pandemic, 
and I expect it to continue in the future. So uh, Southeast Asian countries like uh, Vietnam, Indonesia, Singapore, the Philippines, Thailand will all become stronger exporters to the United States and more integrated uh, members of critical supply chains. And I think uh, engaging these countries in discussions on supply chain security um, not only speaks to their interest in economic development, but speaks to both our side's interest in, in, uh, in increased supply chain security. Uh, this is uh, a very strong way for us, I think, to interact with the Southeast Asians. And I think it's a strong way for us to interact with our like-minded partners and allies like Japan and Australia. So I think that the, uh, the stronger this uh, item in our agenda is, the better. Great. Th thank you. And I notice I'm out of time. So let me go ahead and recognize the ranking member, Mr. Shabell, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Sobolik, I'll start with you. Uh, as I mentioned in my opening statement, I'm co-chair of the Philippine uh, Friendship uh, Caucus. And I'd like to know what we can do to better support the Philippines to help them uh, push back on China's gray zone aggression. Specifically, they face uh, constant harassment uh, from the so-called maritime militia. Uh, what security support or means can we use to help the Philippines with this challenge? Sir, thank you so much for that question. Uh, the crux of our response with the Philippines specifically has to be strengthening uh, our enhanced defense cooperation agreement with Manila. Uh, this was established back in 2014 given the recent tensions surrounding human rights, global Magnitsky sanctions that have targeted President, Duter President Duterte's close associations, uh, this agreement has been slow to come into actuality. But getting our troops and our assets rotating regularly in and out uh, of pre-specified military bases throughout the Philippines gives us a presence. Uh, beyond what we already have, uh, a strengthened presence uh, with the Philippines uh, and a cooperative one at that. And I think it not only sends a, an important signal to China, uh, it is a material action. Uh, so whatever we do to reinforce uh, our commitment, that has to be the crux of it. Thank you. Let me go a little bit beyond uh, my, the first question. I'll stick with you, Mr. Sobo, for the time being. Um, China's aggressive behavior in the South China Sea has been concerning for, you know, quite some time. Um, you know, they've repeat, repeatedly sought to enforce uh, their bogus sovereignty claims against Vietnam, Malaysia, and as I mentioned, Philippines. Uh, what support, whether political, military, uh, or other uh, wise, can we provide to help our partners uphold uh, their rights against uh, the PRC's bullying? Uh, it, it starts uh, with, to an extent, doing what we're already doing, sir. Uh, the, the freedom of navigation operations are good. Uh, going beyond that, though, is important because it's clear, given recent pronouncements from China, not only that they're more fully engaging gray zone tactics with their Coast Guard, uh, they are also trying to reinforce their claims within their own nine dash line, which, of, of course, we reject. Uh, I, I think one of the, the most creative and admittedly difficult, uh, but good things we could do is involve our own Coast Guard more in the South China Sea. Uh, if our goal is to deter adventurism without risking uh, escalation, meeting capability for capability and service for service can be a good way to do this. And, and there's becoming, there's starting to be a little more research about this area coming out of integrating our Coast Guard assets more and more. And I think it's worth studying. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, Professor Shear, let me turn to you now. Um, I, uh, I'm a believer and I'm glad uh, that uh, this administration has entered into AUKUS, uh, the new partnership. I think it's an important idea. The reaction throughout the ASEAN uh, countries has been a bit uh, mixed, as you know. Um, how, how could this partnership and also the Quad um, how is that being viewed and what can we do uh, to strengthen both those uh, those partnerships? Thank you, Congressman, um, for that. That's an important question. Um, uh, clearly, ASEAN centrality is an important uh, theme in uh, whatever ASEAN states, statesmen and stateswomen 
say about uh, regional stability and security. Uh, and we need to respect ASEAN centrality. However, uh, given ASEAN's uh, uh, divisiveness um, and lack of unity, we need to look for alternatives to bringing our influence to bear on the region. I think we need to do that bilaterally with uh, important individual ASEAN partners, and we knew, need to do it multilaterally. And I think the Quad and AUKUS are key tools for us to do that. Uh, as I said in my, uh, my statement, um, the AUKUS announcement sent a strong signal to the region about our commitment. The ASEANs, I think, given their devotion to ASEAN centrality, have to react uh, in a lukewarm fashion uh, publicly. But I think privately, they will welcome uh, the Quad. They'll welcome the, the, uh, the creation of AUKUS. This gives them more leverage vis-a-vis -vis China. When the Southeast Asians know that the Americans and their allies are part and partners are strongly engaged in the region, this gives them the confidence they need to uh, bring leverage to bear on the Chinese to get what they want and to uh, uh, pursue their interests in a, in a uh, free and open way. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, my time has expired, but let me uh, join with you uh, and Ms. Miller relative to her TPP uh, comments and just say that when the leaders of our two parties back in 2016 uh, both decided to oppose this, the term shooting ourselves in the foot uh, comes to mind. And we put the PRC in a position where they're now trying to get in there and write the rules uh, to replace the United States. And that's just, uh, you know, that's just a boneheaded thing uh, for us to be in that position. And uh, so I commend you for supporting it as I did, Mr. Uh, Chairman. And uh, sorry I didn't get around to you, Ms. Miller, but I agreed with your points on TPP. Thank you, and I yield back. Great. Thank you. Um, let me now recognize um, the gentleman from California, Mr. Sherman, for five minutes. Thank you. It's appropriate that we're having a hearing on Southeast Asia. Naturally, we have Southeast Asia experts. What tends to happen then is that people who focus their lives on Southeast Asia push for a policy that is measured by, does this help us in our relationships in Southeast Asia? When we talk about trade, we've got a balance. Is this good for our relationships in Southeast Asia? But what effect does it have on small towns in Ohio? And I know that one of our witnesses talked about how we can more effectively import from Southeast Asia. We have a, the largest trade deficit in the history of mammalian life on this planet. And uh, I think it's important that we focus even more attention on how we can export to Southeast Asia. Uh, the value of the dollar is, is not, as, as a worldwide reserve currency, uh, is certainly not helped by us having uh, the charade we're having here about whether we'll even pay our bills uh, nor uh, is it helped by the trade deficit. Likewise, with regard to aid to countries in Southeast Asia, experts in Southeast Asia say, well, help everybody, and then if somebody does something wrong, maybe we'll give them a little bit less. That gives us the most leverage. If you're giving money to Southeast Asia, the more you give, the more leverage you have, you might take it away. But every dollar that we give to the government of Myanmar, Burma, is a dollar we're not spending on uh, the truly needy in Africa, for example. And so I'd like our witnesses to focus on uh, the Rohingya. Uh, we were all, uh, those of us who focus on human rights for, for decades, uh, I met with Anwan uh, Suki uh, several times. We were all inspired by her. And now um, she is the, uh, the apologist for uh, a policy of ethnic cleansing, if not genocide. And actually, I think it is genocide. Uh, I have suggested in this uh, hearing that we ought to look at the international border. If the government of Myanmar, um, uh, Burma, cannot defend its own people. Now, that's a radical step, but there's only one change of international border that the United States has uh, supported uh, in this century. And that it was the creation of South Sudan, and we did so uh, as a result of uh, acts of uh, 
of, uh, of, of genocide, probably less in terms of the numbers of casualties uh, and displaced people uh, than what the Rohingya have seen. Um, so uh, I'll ask uh, uh, Mr. Shear, um, uh, should we uh, uh, be providing aid? Obviously, we should be providing aid to the refugees, uh, but should we be providing aid that uh, provides for the economic development uh, of, uh, of Burma, Myanmar at a time when it refuses uh, to provide citizenship documents and protection for the Rohingya people? Thank you, Congressman. That's a critical question. Uh, and I'd like first to address the Rohingya issue. I think as we move forward and increase the pressure on the military regime in Burma, the Tatmadaw, Madaw, I think we need to uh, continue providing assistance to uh, the Rohingya. We need to continue focusing on their horrific condition in, in uh, camps throughout the region. There are over 700,000 Rohingyas in Bangladesh alone, in Cox's mm -hmm. Bahar, Cox's Bazaar. Um, and we need to avoid the phenomenon of donor fatigue with the Rohingyas. So I think, I think as we... we um, it, the, the, the comment I would make is the fact that we're still providing tens of millions of dollars to help the government of Myanmar, Burma achieve its economic objectives uh, is a stain on uh, uh, the morality of the United States. Uh, if, a if a government is engaging in genocide and ethnic cleansing to say, well, we're giving the money, we're giving them less money than we used to, uh, is, uh, is, is an inadequate response. But go ahead. Well, I, I agree that we need to uh, limit uh, all the resources we can that go to the military regime. Um, I think we need to be discriminating, though. Um, uh, we need to, as I said in my statement, we need to keep the Burmese people on our side. We need to make sure that the measures we take to inflict pain on the military regime don't also excessively uh, inflict pain on the Burmese people. Every I dollar that we spend helping improve the economy of Myanmar, Burma, increases the power of regime and is taken away from the poor people uh, in, in other places in the world, particularly Africa, I yield back. Great, thank you. Let me now recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Perry, for five minutes. Hey, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I guess my, my first question, at least, is gonna go to Mr. Sobolik, and it, it's in regard to Duterte in the Philippines. Um, he, he chose to terminate the visiting forces agreement uh, some time ago, but has recently, as I understand it, uh, reinstated that. And I'm just wondering if you can describe to us whether you think this is this kind of shift back towards the United States and away from the CCP is is real or it's just a small calculation if it's if it has any long lasting endurance or if this is completely fragile and just a momentary uh, decision on Duterte's part to kind of uh, advance some leverage that he might perceive that he can have regarding the CCP. Congressman, thank you for that question. It's, it's, it's very important. Uh, President Duterte was highly opportunistic with his decision to hold uh, the Visiting Forces Agreement hostage. Uh, his threat to do so came shortly uh, on the heels of human rights sanctions, as I mentioned earlier. And uh, I, and, and cer certainly several others, interpreted uh, his anger and his focus on the VFA uh, as his response, uh, not necessarily to pull the trigger on the agreement, uh, but for domestic reasons and frankly, for balancing reasons against China to build some political space for himself. And it became pretty apparent in late 2020 that he was going to punt his decision on VFA into the Biden administration. And shortly after the Biden administration taking office, he signaled his complete support once again for the VFA. And I, I think in, in some ways Duterte's behavior, while he is certainly a unique individual, is not that unlike the calculations that many Southeast 
Asian countries will make from time to time caught between two great powers as they are. Okay, thank you. And then, uh, you know, just to expand on that a little bit before my next question. So, you know, it, looks, it, it, it seems like he remains opportunistic um, and that he doesn't necessarily in any way, maybe, maybe it's just based on who's, who's in the White House at the time and how he perceives things, but he is definitely can't be counted in any meaningful way in the camp of the United States or the West. Would be, that be a reasonable kind of overarching theme? I would certainly say that President Duterte himself uh, is does not fit into the mold he just described. But I would also say that the defense architecture within the government of the Philippines is highly supportive of the defense cooperation they have with the United States. And and putting the president aside for the moment, which I know it can be a, a significant ask whenever addressing these things, but putting him aside for the moment, the relationship is quite strong. And there is a lot of ground to build upon. And Duterte has proven himself to be pretty shrewd and cunning. And uh, he'll tilt towards America when it serves his interests, towards Beijing when it serves his interests. But the good news for us in the midst of that is the underlying foundation of the relationship does not appear to be fragile. Okay, thank you. And then I'm just curious, uh, you know, from a regional standpoint um, regarding the CCP and Taiwan, you know, the CCP as they as they as they lose, uh, you know, they get, you know, they're obviously billions of people in China, but they're still going to suffer a, a loss of uh, of male workers, male people in industry and business just based on demographics. Do you see that being a pressure point that that uh, Xi would uh, seek to it, it would force Xi into making a decision regarding Taiwan um, earlier, or do you think that they literally feel like they they can manage that and everything else that they uh, that they they're seeking to um, seeking to accomplish? Uh, you know, regional and 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 international hegemony, et cetera. Do you think that they feel they can manage it, or do you think that they see that as something that's going to be very very problematic by the end of the century? Oh, Congressman, that is the million dollar question, is it not? Uh, I, I think you're right to bring up demographics as a, a long leading indicator in PRC calculus, not only unemployed males, but the uh, the gender disparity between men and women in China as well, uh, which I, I recognize your time is up, but, but it's a very important question to be asking. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield the balance. Great. Let me go ahead and recognize the gentlelady from Nevada, Ms. Titus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you to our witnesses. It's very interesting information. I'd like to ask Ms. Miller, just kind of expanding on some of the things the U.S. can do to be helpful in the region, uh, besides just economic trade agreements. Uh, one thing that we know is that Southeast Asia is one of the world's most heavily contaminated regions with deadly unexploded ordnance. U.S. legacy cluster munitions from the Vietnam War are in Laos and Cambodia and in Vietnam, and they continue to cause civilian uh, deaths or casualties to this day, and they make some of the productive land potentially out of use. If you travel over there, especially in Cambodia, on the streets of the city, you see these little pickup bands of people missing limbs, begging on the streets. Uh, they're all victims of these uh, mines that haven't been eliminated. We have a demining program, and I, I think it serves as a positive example of our leadership and what good things that we can do to support communities. Could you comment on how things like that can uh, better help our relations in the area as we try to combat the kind of insidious influence of China? Congresswoman Titus, thank you for your leadership on this issue and, and for raising this question. Um, I think it's an excellent example of a platform that has helped to facilitate our relationship uh, in Cambodia, but also importantly in Vietnam, um, which came from a very low bar when I first started working on Vietnam relations almost 20 years ago to where we are today, where we have a close 
relationship across a range of issues. And part of the success of the normalization of our relationship was based on trust building exercises uh, such as you described uh, in terms of demining and finding um, the remains of American soldiers in the region and returning them to the United States. I think importantly, your question also um, signals that we need to have a strategy that allows us to engage um, communities and societies in these countries, not only the elites in the government, um, but we need the American presence and our positive contributions to the region to be understood broadly throughout civil society in Southeast Asia. And these kinds of programs are an excellent example of that. There are uh, many others that I would commend to the committee's consideration for further uh, enhancement, including the Young YCLE, the Young Southeast Asia uh, Leaders Initiative um, program, particularly to engage young people, I think are very important for our standing and our relationships in the region going forward. Well, thank you. I'm glad to hear that. I hope we can put some support behind uh, NDI, IRI, uh, those kinds of programs that to come from uh, that side of our kind of soft diplomacy. One other thing I think that we could be doing better is on climate change uh, with the new relationship, the kind of redone global climate risk index shows that some of these countries are the worst in the world for being affected by climate change. I think it's called the Mekong River Commission that's composed of Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, and Vietnam. Is that not another way that we can better collaborate and uh, cooperate with some of these countries on issues that affect the planet but affect their economies as well? Thank you, Congresswoman. I absolutely agree with that statement and know from conversations with Southeast Asian leaders and civil society and environmental groups, the threat of climate change is top of mind for countries throughout the region. There have been several studies issued, uh, as you note, that uh, identify Southeast Asia as one of the parts of the world that will be most critically affected um, due to rising sea levels and flooding, particularly in the, in the Mekong region. Um, U.S. participation in the Lower Mekong Initiative is a really important part of our engagement in the region, uh, and there is room to do more, I think, on climate change. I know uh, Secretary uh, Kerry uh, has dedicated much of his career to um, normalizing the U.S. relationship with Vietnam. He knows that part of the world very well, um, and I think there's uh, a lot of scope for enhanced engagement and interest on both sides in deepening that part of our cooperation, both in terms of mitigation, but also adaptation is going to be very important to the region's economic prospects going forward. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Miller. Mr. Chairman, maybe we can pursue that as something this committee could uh, take up and uh, look into further, perhaps help with. I yield back. Very much. And, and we'll take that under consideration because obviously very important to the region. Um, let me now go ahead and recognize the gentlelady from Missouri, Ms. Wagner, for five minutes. I uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for organizing the hearing to examine the strategically critical relationship between the United States and Southeast Asia. As co-chair of the Congressional Caucus on the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or ASEAN, I strongly believe we have a national interest in sustaining U.S. leadership in Southeast Asia, supporting human rights and respect for democratic freedoms, and articulating our strategic priorities. We will find willing partners in our many friends and allies in the region who share our grave concerns regarding the belligerence and the growing power of the People's Republic of China. Yet, the PRC, eager to undermine U.S. interests in the key region, is aggressively working to expand its influence in Southeast Asia. It, it seeks to exploit its predatory investment, development, and trade policies, illegal military installations in the South China Sea, and disinformation campaigns to coerce countries to accept its agenda. Nowhere are the high stakes of the competition between China and the United States clearer than in Southeast Asia, where the Chinese Communist Party is fostering a uh, resurgence in authoritarianism and oppression. It is imperative that the United States show strong and consistent leadership in Southeast Asia to secure a future in which the rule of law, 
free and fair trade and democracy underpin relations among Indo-Pacific states. Beijing allows its state-owned enterprises, or SOEs, to borrow at an extremely low interest rate uh, from public uh, financial institutions. And as a result, these SOEs have dominated project bids in Southeast Asia, a primary target of the Belt and Road Initiative. I am deeply concerned that these policies are designed to draw Southeast, A Southeast Asian countries into Beijing's sphere of influence. And Ms. Miller, how should the United States work with Southeast Asian countries to prevent SOEs from boxing out more responsible, let's say, investors? Thank you very much, uh, Congresswoman Wagner, for your question and also your leadership of the U.S. ASEAN Caucus. It's a really important conduit for engagement uh, with the region. And you asked a really important and complicated question. Um, oftentimes, the United States um, is compared to China's activities in the region in an apples to oranges way, when in reality, our economies are fundamentally different in how we organize ourselves around our economic engagement and commercial diplomacy is very different. Um, in the light of the tremendous amount of resources that China has uh, allocated to the region for these projects, I think it's really important for the United States to pre pre prepare and to be an alternative, to work with our partners in the Quad, uh, which has infrastructure as a, a focus area, and our partners in ASEAN to help countries improve um, their capacity to negotiate uh, infrastructure deals that are transparent and adhere to international standards, and for the United States to work with our partners to provide alternative uh, means of financing some of these infrastructure projects. For thank Southeast you. Asia, oh, thank thank you. you so much. My limited time here. Uh, the United States, Japan, Australia, and India are joining forces to an frankly, in an unprecedented degree to promote a free and open Indo-Pacific region. I believe we should welcome this re kind of revitalized quad partnership. However, I understand why Southeast Asian countries may feel that, um, that the recent focus on the quad leaves them vulnerable to China's influence uh, operations. Mr. Uh, Sobolik, what role should ASEAN countries play in the United States Indo-Pacific strategy? Representative Wagner, thank you so much for that question. I, I think you're right to bring up potential tensions between the Quad and ASEAN. I, I think one way to potentially square that is to begin behind closed doors at first to back channel uh, upcoming Quad actions, not only with ASEAN member states bilaterally, but through ASEAN specifically and begin to communicate very intentionally that we see no trade-off between our engagement with ASEAN and our engagements with the Quad. And I think that is gonna be a very important message for ASEAN and for ASEAN member states to receive from us. I think you're absolutely right. Uh, my time has expired, Mr. Chairman, so I'm going to yield back. I have several more questions, but I shall submit them um, for the record. Thank you all for, for being here. Thank you, Ms. Wagner. Let me now recognize the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Levin, for five minutes. Thanks so much, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, for your uh, great leadership of this subcommittee and, and having another important hearing. Uh, I want to try to get to COVID-19 and uh, climate change. So starting with COVID-19, uh, Southeast Asia continues to struggle uh, with contain containing the pandemic and particularly with the spread of the Delta variant. So let me start with you, Ambassador Shear. others may weigh in. Have certain countries been more successful in their approaches to COVID? And if yes, uh, what's been the key or keys to their success? And could those uh, steps be, right, or, 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 or you know, systems be replicated elsewhere? Um, and then, Beyond additional vaccine donations, what are some ways that the U.S. can support Southeast Asian countries in their fight against COVID? Thank you, Congressman Levin, for that very important question. Uh, I, I think the country that is known to ha have uh, done among the best in Southeast Asia in combating the pandemic is Vietnam. 
and they implemented some very rigorous um, and some might think uh, rigid uh, ways of, of containing the virus. Uh, they, they promoted lockdowns. Uh, they banned uh, travel to and from the country, um, as many others have. Um, they required testing to the extent that they, they've been able to provide test kits um, and uh, rigorous um, uh, contact tracing. So the Vietnamese have been very zealous in the way in which they've uh, limited uh, social contact um, and uh, some might say uh, sacrificed um, civil liberties in order to contain this virus. And I think mm -hmm. um, what the Vietnamese experience demonstrates um, for us is the importance of social cohesion. Um, all the method methods they may have used um, uh, might not be applicable, certainly in the United States, but certainly the uh, the uh, high level of social cohesion uh, in Vietnam certainly um, contributed to their relatively successful management of the virus. Now, they've been hit uh, more strongly by the Delta variant. They've had an uptick of cases. I think the vice president's trip um, uh, recently, uh, her stop in Vietnam, resulted in important uh, uh, increase in cooperation between Vietnam and the United States. She provided another, um, uh, she donated another uh, million doses of the vaccine to the, to the Vietnamese, which brought our contribution to Vietnam, I believe up to 5 million doses. And um, for the long term, more importantly, we established a CDC center in Vietnam, which will assist the Vietnamese and the region, not only in uh, combating the pandemic, but uh, hopefully preventing future uh, pandemics as well. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Let me try to hit my climate change question. Maybe I'll give Ms. Uh, uh, Miller the first shot at this. Um, obviously, uh, climate change uh, is really a huge uh, issue for Southeast Asian nations. It's one of the regions that's most vulnerable to the harmful effects um of climate change so what can the u.s do to support regional actors in addressing climate change uh, challenges that threaten their economies particularly uh, maritime southeast asian uh, nations and you know i've been on this kick about i hear so much uh talk about belt and road and i feel like a lot of the talk about it is very anxious and defensive where i think we should have a a uh, big-hearted, broad-shouldered American response, where we don't we don't react, but we say, "Wow, these countries need to change." Let, we all do everything about how we get our power, transportation, everything, and that we ought to get in there and partner with them to create a lot of jobs by deploying mass amounts of offshore wind, solar, and so forth. So, thoughts on that? I I didn't leave you a lot of time, but <laughs> I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. Maybe the chairman will be a little indulgent. Go ahead. Thank you, Congressman Levin, for your question and your, your interest in that issue, which is very important to Southeast Asians. I think there are a lot of things that the U.S. can do, particularly working with our private sector, as you note. There's a tremendous need in the region for infrastructure development, especially to deal with the impacts of climate change and for technologies to help with um, having urbanization that doesn't uh, you know, rapidly increase the, the region's emissions profile. Um, Southeast Asia's middle class is uh, targeted to double between now and 2030, which will have a huge impact on consumption. And the U.S. has a lot of technology and a lot of innovations that can be deployed to help manage that challenge. And I think it's definitely an area uh, worth further investment on both sides. Okay, thanks, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. Great, thanks. I don't see Dr. Green on camera, so let me go next to the gentleman from Kentucky, um, Mr. Barr. Thank you, Chairman Barra. I appreciate this hearing. Very uh, excellent hearing, and I very much appreciate. Can you hear me okay? I, I can. I'm gonna I'm gonna recognize um, Mark Green because he. Just oh, is he back? I'm sorry. Okay. okay. Yeah. This is you started so. Let me, my, let me get to recognize the gentleman from Tennessee, Dr. Green, for five sure. minutes. My apologies, Mr. Chairman, and of course, my apologies to my colleague from Kentucky. Um, the uh, It's interesting. I, I went to West Point in 1982, only seven years after the fall of 
uh, Saigon. And a lot of the guys who taught basic training for me had fought in the Vietnam War. Our, our, the United States military has this tendency to become really, really good at and study really, really well the last war we fought. And uh, it, it's, it's something we need to be better about, obviously. I, I think we're trying our best to be better at that. But I say that to say when I was at the academy, I mean, we were studying Vietnam. We were studying the people. We were studying how the war was fought there, the mistakes that the United States made. And it created for me a real heart for the people. My West Point classmate actually served in the MIA uh, commission and traveled all over Laos and uh, Vietnam trying to find the, the, the Americans that, aren't, that we were not able to bring home. Again, just have a huge heart for, for that part of the world. And when I was uh, a young lieutenant, took some master's programs in developing nations with a focus on Southeast Asia. So uh, this is this conference, Mr. Chairman, is or this committee hearing is, is fantastic, and I really appreciate it. Um, my questions are, of course, much like everybody else's. How you know China and and nearshoring and all the things that are impacting our relationship with uh, Southeast Asia. Um, my my first question to uh, Mr. Sobolik. Um, there's no doubt that America's supply chain is overly reliant on, on China. Uh, with regards to reshoring and nearshoring efforts, how can we reduce our reliance on China with minimal impact and disruption with what this massive shift has been going on for some time to, uh, to Vietnam and, and other countries in Southeast Asia? Uh, Representative Green, thanks so much for asking that question. It is, it is one of the most important ones, not just economically, but geopolitically right now. I, I think the reality is at some level, uh, there is going to be some uncomfortable disruption. And I think one of the complicating factors of that is it's difficult to say for certain uh, which countries and which interest groups are going to get the brunt of that. But I, I think a few things are important uh, as we talk about uh, reshoring and nearshoring, as you put it. Uh, the first one is going to be uh, a consistent message to our Southeast Asian partners uh, that, of course, uh, fair trade matters a great deal to the American people, uh, as successive elections have demonstrated. Uh, but the United States still does believe in free trade. And I think the reality is that uh, our friends, allies, partners in Southeast Asia are going to be uh, the greatest victors of free trade moving forward, or at least one of the greatest victors and, and uh, reap the benefits of free trade. And it is to our strategic benefit uh, that we uh, near shore a lot of the manufacturing we've relied on from China to our friends, allies, and partners there. And, and it goes to this fundamental tension that we've been discussing directly and indirectly during this whole hearing, which is uh, ASEAN's economic reliance on China on the one hand, and on the other hand, their security dependence on us. And we obviously need to play both sides of that equation, not just reasserting our dependability with defense, but easing their economic dependence on China however we can. You know, the, the questions that I have, because clearly we want some nearshoring to happen. We see, uh, you know, China's commodity boom created a run on the currencies in Latin America. Uh, and I'm the ranking Republican on uh, Western Hemisphere, so this is my uh, sort of area. Um, and in so doing, made manufacturing in Latin America much more expensive relative to Chinese uh, manufactured goods. And so the manufacturing section sector in Latin America took a massive hit. This desire for, I, I think, a bipartisan desire. I just made a trip with Alvio Ceres to Dominican Republic. And, and so there's this bipartisan desire to see uh, some manufacturing come back to Latin America. One of the big concerns is, you know, the supply chain for parts when something is assembled. And I'd be interested in understanding a little better how the, particularly the Southeast Asian countries are going to feel about and, and what their thoughts are going to be support of. So being the initial sort of parts manufacturer that then get reassembled in Latin America as opposed to reassembled in China. What, what impact and how they're going to look at us after we try to pull that off? Uh, sir, uh, that is a fantastic question. Uh, in full transparency, it's one I haven't given a whole lot of time to. So uh, in respect to you, I would, ra if you're okay, sir, I'd rather take some time and circle back with your office and give you a better answer than try to give you something now. Very much so. Appreciate it. Now you yield, uh, Mr. Chairman. 
Great, thank you. Let me now recognize the gentlelady from Pennsylvania, Ms. Hulahan, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and just confirming that you can hear me. We can. Perfect. And thank you so much to everyone for joining us today. My questions are going to focus largely on Vietnam, and I would also likely run out of time. So I'd like to submit the rest that I'm not able to get to for the record. I am, uh, as many others have talked about, really concerned about supply chains and our dependency on China. Uh, specifically, I'm going to focus on rare earth elements. Um, for the ambassador, sir, uh, Vietnam is one of the top 10 uh, largest sources of rare earth elements in the world. And we really need to figure out a way to overcome China's near monopoly on rare earth elements. And Vietnam and Japan apparently have launched a joint research center at Ho in Hanoi to improve extraction and processing of these materials. I was wondering if you might know what impact the rare earth research technology transfer center has been having in Vietnam and Japan in terms of diversifying their supply of rare earth elements away from China. Uh, and if there are any pathways for the U.S. and the economies of Southeast Asia to reduce their reliance on Chinese rare earth elements in the supply chain. And lastly, I know I have a lot of questions, but this is just one of them. How can we as the U.S. effectively support research efforts across the region and particularly in Vietnam uh, to identify substitutes or to develop approaches to reduce the amount of these elements that are required or to recycle, reduce and reuse them? Ambassador Scher, you might be on mute. Congresswoman, thank you for that important question. It's, uh, of course, a question that touches on the supply of all electronic parts uh, globally, since rare earths are critical components of electronic parts. And uh, the world has been looking for alternatives to uh, the Chinese supply since they slapped an embargo on the export of rare earth uh, elements to Japan, I believe, in 2010. Uh, the Vietnamese certainly are eager to help fill the demand. As you say, they have a uh, generous um, endowment of, of rare earth minerals. I think they would welcome uh, uh, investments in that industry, not just from Japan, but from the United States as well. I, when I was in Vietnam, I encouraged uh, Vietnam-Japan cooperation across the board, including on rare earth minerals. And I think it offers us an opportunity to um, expand the supply, move, move uh, at least portions of the supply away from China. I think we need to be doing that um, uh, globally as well as just with Vietnam. Uh, and Ms. Miller, you also spoke a little bit about uh, Vietnam uh, in your opening remarks. Do you have anything further to add in the area of specifically of rare earth elements and re uh, reducing our dependence and frankly, Vietnam's dependence on, on China in the pathways to uh, process and develop these, these critical materials? Thank you, Representative, for your question. Perhaps I'll just briefly add on to what Ambassador Scheer said in that uh, Vietnam, as a matter of strategic priority, is interested in decreasing its dependence on China. And I think any um, opportunities to work with the United States and Japan in this area would be uh, very welcomed um, on the Vietnamese side. Could I ask you to be um, specific on what kind of options you see for us to be able to help Vietnam move up the uh, value chain and to diversify and, and to not be so dependent? My impression is that there's a lot of cross-border um, supply chain issues going on, uh, origin of China, maybe processing in Vietnam, and then maybe going backwards into China for uh, further manufacturing. Um, is there anything that we can be doing specifically to be more helpful to be able to advance Vietnam's um, pro uh, kind of standing on the supply chain ladder? Uh, Representative Houlihan, on the rare earth side, let me come back to you with a more detailed explanation as I'm not following that issue very closely. But I think in terms of overall supply chain diversification, um, the relationship between Vietnam and China is very close, particularly as many industries have moved into Vietnam from southern China as their costs have risen and in some cases to, to access other markets. Um, there is an opportunity, I think, for the U.S. to continue to strengthen our trade relationship with Vietnam. It's become increasingly important for a number of our manufacturers who are seeking to diversify their own supply chains um, out of China. And a big piece of that is working to help improve the overall business environment and the trade relationship between our two countries. 
And I thank you all. And I know I've, I've nearly run out of time. I would like to submit the balance of my questions for the record. And I would specifically really like to, um, to find out some better information on the Rare Earth Research Technology Transfer Center and see uh, if we might be able to suss out how effective or ineffective that is. And with that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Great, thank you. Let me now recognize a gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Barr. Well, thanks again, Mr. Chairman, um, for holding this uh, very important hearing and to our excellent witnesses, very insightful testimony. Let me, let me start with uh, Mr. Uh, Sabalik about your written testimony um, related to Afghanistan and the, the impact that our withdrawal from Afghanistan has had in exacerbating this uh, point of testimony that you have that, quote, the United States has proven itself a fickle and unsteady ally. Uh, this is concerning to me with regard to um, uh, U.S. efforts to bring ASEAN countries closer to the United States and drive a wedge between us and the People's Republic of China. I think your point that uh, geographic proximity is not the only problem here. And in the wake of the United States retreat from Afghanistan, we have seen the CCP capitalize on fears that the United States would not honor our obligations to protect our allies and partners. You cite the historical example of the withdrawal from Vietnam as another problem. But how has the Afghanistan debacle affected our credibility with partner nations in the region? And do these ASEAN countries, particularly the Philippines, uh, who ha have to regularly combat incursions in the South China Sea by China, how do they still view the United States as a legitimate and trustworthy security partner in light of Afghanistan? Uh, Representative Barr, thank you very much for that question. Uh, I'll dive into parts of my testimony in responding to you that I wasn't able to share with the full committee earlier on. Uh, the fundamental problem that the United States has with our withdrawal uh, withdrawal from Afghanistan is that we are now largely dependent on the China, on China, and to an extent Russia as well, to police the Taliban and, and to lean on them uh, to crack down on terror groups operating inside of Afghanistan. And to put a really fine point on it, we are relying on other great powers who are adversarial towards us to prevent the next big terrorist attack inside of America, which then imposes significant limitations on our ability to compete effectively with the Chinese Communist Party. And we're seeing some of these dynamics come to fruition, not just because of the lost leverage we have with Afghanistan, but because of this administration's understandable desire to cooperate with the PRC on specific issues like climate change or others. The reality though, which I believe is becoming clearer, especially in the wake of uh, the uh, uh, United Nations General Assembly speeches, Xi Jinping's commitment to not uh, fund coal manufacturing anymore, how that was a product of John Kerry's negotiations. We're starting to see some give and take uh, and some breaking ground between Washington and Beijing. Uh, to, and my fear is that the cooperative agenda is starting to overtake the competitive one. Now, what this means but potentially is even though we have great defense agreements like AUKUS, we have great things like the Quad on the defense side, on the human rights side, and frankly, the counterterrorism side, we're losing leverage to the Chinese Communist Party, which makes it difficult for us in the gray zone to actually be active and proactive in defending our Southeast Asian partners day to day. Thank you for that. And and my re remaining time, let me just reclaim my time and ask specifically about Singapore to, to any of our witnesses. Um, as you know, we do have a strong relationship, especially in, um, uh, in, in the economic relationship with Singapore. Uh, they are the wealthiest ASEAN member, accounting for 80% of US ASEAN FDI and a majority of US services exports to and imports from ASEAN countries is Singapore. Um, but it is troubling to hear the Singapore foreign minister uh, talk about viewing China purely as an adversary to be contained will not work in the long term. Um, what, what can we do? Are there specific areas that the United States can bring Singapore further into the orbit of the United States? H how are we seeing Beijing attempt to under undermine our relationship? What do we need to do to further integrate our economies to, again, uh, bring them closer to us as opposed to China?
Any, uh, how about the ambassador? Could you answer that? I'd like to take that on, Congressman, because I think it's a, a fundamentally uh, important question. Um, our relationship with Singapore is very strong. When we pulled out of the Philippines, the Singaporeans um, very shrewdly, very uh, adroitly, I think, offered us uh, facilities in Singapore to station some of our forces. We continue to have rotational uh, uh, forces in Singapore. Uh, Singapore also hosts a, uh, a Navy logistics command. Um, I think we need to uh, encourage Singapore to cooperate more closely, possibly to uh, uh, host more rotational forces, while recognizing the limitations Singapore's instinct to balance the U.S. and China is. I think we, can, we need to push the envelope, um, but we don't know how far we can go yet. Which ASEAN country is most likely to be a candidate uh, in the future to join the Quad? I, I would, with regards to partnership with the Quad, I think we should put priority on the Philippines, Vietnam, Singapore, and Indonesia. In fact, I think we should put priority on those four countries in all of our approaches to uh, ASEAN and Southeast Asia. Um, uh, I think that Philippines may be more likely in the long run, perhaps after President Duterte leaves, to cooperate with the Quad. I think we can uh, elicit um, gradual, uh, uh, incremental uh, cooperation from Vietnam and the Singapore, and Singapore. But we're going to have to be patient. We're going to have to settle for incremental steps. Um, and we're going to have to be adept in the way in which we propose this uh, these uh, uh, activities to the Southeast Asians. For then, I'm just going to say the gentleman's time has expired. Um, Thank you. Hey, Thank you. Appreciate the ambassador's thoughts there. Let me recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Holly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for having this hearing, and thank you to our witnesses, all thoughtful. Um, Mr. Sobolik, just real quickly, you said there were three major events that sort of influenced the attitude toward the United States in the Southeast Asian region. The first was our withdrawal from Vietnam after that uh, costly war. What, remind us what the other two were. Uh, with pleasure, Congressman. Thank you so much for asking. The other two were the Asian financial crisis in 1997 yep. and our uh, delayed response to China's reclamation and militarization of fake islands in the South China Sea. Thank you. So I guess I would say, and I'm going to ask Ambassador Sher and, and uh, Ms. Miller to respond, but I, I find that list, while certainly important, to me, one of the most pivotal decisions that's affected in recent time our relations throughout this region was the, to me, catastrophic decision to renounce our own negotiated trade agreement, the TPP. Uh, which would have undergird 40% of the world's economic trade uh, and would have anchored these countries in a relationship with the United States. By renouncing it, we basically left them to the tender loving mercies of China, which quickly filled the vacuum. Um, and I think that's one of the most consequential decisions uh, of the previous president, uh, which is going to have huge uh, ramifications going forward. Ambassador Scheer, your reaction and your analysis of the fallout from the renouncement of our own treaty, the TPP. Ambassador Scheer, you are muted. Ambassador Scheer, we can't hear you. And you need Thank you, to, Ambassador Scheer, you need to speak up. Thank you, Congressman. Can you hear me now? Yes. I agree that uh, withdrawal from the TPP was a mistake. As I said in my statement, I think it was a blunder. I can say that with great confidence, I think, from the strategic perspective. Um, I, I'm not an economist, but I, I know that the strategic argument had great appeal to the Southeast Asians. It had great appeal, particularly to the Vietnamese. I made that the strategic argument to the Vietnamese when I was ambassador, as they were considering whether or not they would join the TPP. I think it had a decisive effect on the Vietnamese decision to join the TPP, in addition to all of the economic benefits that they would reap from the agreement. So uh, when we pulled out of the Viet when we pulled out of the TPP, um, the Vietnamese felt like they'd had the rug pulled out from under them. 
and they made that pretty clear to me who had been uh, had, had borne so much responsibility for getting them in in the first place. Uh, Ms. Miller. Thank you, Congressman Connolly. Um, I agree with everything that Ambassador Scheer said. Um, I think particularly in the case of Vietnam, uh, a fair amount of political capital was expended domestically to come up to the standards of the TPP agreement, particularly on labor. Um, and the U.S. withdrawal was seen as a real blow. Um, Malaysia has also not yet ratified TPTPP. I think the, the withdrawal of the United States was also something that um, caused them to reevaluate their participation and also um, the commitment of the United States in the trade arena. So just very briefly, I think that's one of the obstacles that we would have to getting back in. First is getting our domestic house in order and building um, political will here. But second, you know, we would have um, some challenges, I think, in convincing our partners in the region that we're serious if and when uh, we decide to return to the table. Mr. Sobluk, I know you want to come in. Congressman Connolly, thank you so much. I, I, I echo uh, the sentiments and concerns uh, of Ambassador Scheer and uh, Ms. Miller. I, I think it was a, a sad message that we sent to our friends, allies, and partners uh, who, as, as my colleagues have said, put a lot on the line to get an agreement of that magnitude to the level that, uh, that it reached and then to pull out when we did, it did not send a good message at all strategically. And do you think it's fair, Mr. Sobluk, to say the Chinese have been able to exploit the vacuum we created by that renouncement? They've certainly tried. And I think that they've had some success in trying. Uh, China has proven itself to be very adept at stepping in when we shoot ourselves in the foot, partic uh, particularly in Southeast Asia, and, and they've certainly done it here. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Let me now recognize the gentlelady from California, Congresswoman Kim. Thank you, Chairman Barra, and I'd also like to thank our ranking member, Shabbat, and thank you, our witnesses, for joining us today. You know, given the ch uh, rising challenges and threats posed by competition with the People's Republic of China and our shift towards prioritizing focus on the Indo-Pacific, our relationships with the nations of Southeast Asia are crucial towards securing regional stability and economic prosperity. And to that end, I appreciate the witnesses' comments that it's um, strategic benefit to the United States to trade with Asian partners and strengthen security alliance and assurance to our partners, but easing their trade reliance on PRC. I couldn't agree more. The U.S. should seek to strengthen its bilateral and multilateral trade relationships with Southeast Asian nations to pave the way for future regional cooperation. Furthermore, I believe our country must revisit the CPTPP trade agreement and opportunities for the U.S. to rejoin the framework, which past administrations, both Republican and Democrats, uh, led in negotiating. So let me pose the question to Mr. Sobolik. Would you advocate an effort for the United States to rejoin or join CPTPP? And how should we view China's request to join the agreement versus Taiwan's? And further, let me just throw it all in here. Could you please compare and contrast the benefits of a potential digital trade agreement to U.S. involvement in the CPTPP? And to what extent would such an agreement be enforceable and easier to accomplish than a more comprehensive trade agreement such as CPTPP? Representative Kim, thank you so much for those uh, highly important questions. Uh, first off, I'll, I'll preface with saying uh, I've, I've, I'm not a practicing economist, but strategically, uh, I think there's there would have been immense value uh, to join what was then TPP. Uh, it, it it alleviated or could have alleviated uh, one of the greatest strategic challenges that ASEAN and its member states had. And, and strategically, it was it was quite sad uh, that we walked away from the agreement. Uh, again, purely on strategic merits. Uh, I, I think that there's a lot of justification for reviewing and reassessing that decision. Uh, not saying that as an economist necessarily, but strategically uh, ample, ample reason to revisit. On the, your question of Taiwan, uh, 
uh, yet again, uh, uh, we're seeing Beijing box out Taipei. Uh, they've, they've done it at the World Health Organization to great effect. They've done it at international uh, aviation institutions. Uh, they're doing it here yet again. And it, it, this is has to be one of the biggest priorities we have uh, to not look at Taiwan just as an East Asian problem, but to, but to recognize the overlaps uh, that our interests with Taiwan have in Southeast Asia too. Uh, your question on digital, uh, admittedly, because I, I'm not a practicing economist, I don't want to purport to get too deep into that, but I'm happy to, to do some research and circle back with you if that would be helpful. Sure. Thanks for your perspectives. You know, let me next move on to our approach to human rights versus trade and security interests in Southeast Asia. Uh, Mr. Sobolik, the question to you again, how big an obstacle are current human rights conditions in Southeast Asia to broadening the U.S. economic and security engagement with the region? And how large a priority are human rights to current U.S. policy in Southeast Asia, and what are the implications of Burma's February 1st coup d'etat for broader U.S.-Southeast Asian relations? Uh, Representative Kim, uh, not just a, a good question, but an important one. Uh, in Southeast Asia, uh, we have to approach economic interests and human rights concerns uh, both hands simultaneously. I think the administration is uh, wrong to do that with China, which is I see as fundamentally an adversary, but with friends and partners in Southeast Asia, I think there's a lot of room uh, to discuss and work on both of those issues at the same time, which I think is going to be necessary. Burma, uh, we have to send a, a stronger message than we have, though good steps have been taken by the administration. And I know Congress is considering legislation on this effort uh, as well. Uh, we need to make it difficult for the Tatman Da to access uh, their dollarized accounts anywhere with banks in the world. We have to get tougher on sanctions and we have to do it fast. Thank you. Oops, I'm running out of time, so I'll yield back. Thank, thank you. Let me now recognize the gentlelady from Virginia, Congresswoman Spanberger. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I really appreciate our witnesses being with us here today. And Ambassador Shear, I'd like to focus my questions um, towards you at first. Uh, you know, recognizing that to realize so many of the opportunities that we've talked about today to build the resilience against the challenges we face, whether from foreign countries or threats like climate change, we, the United States, need a strong American diplomatic presence in Southeast Asia. Um, and in addition to speaking local languages um, and really understanding local culture, um, it's also very important for our diplomats to have the right tools. Um, so, Mr. Ambassador, I, I want to first thank you for your service in our diplomatic corps, and, and I would like to open the question up with how do you think the State Department should or could um, or ought to update um, and or bolster the, uh, the department's capacities and capabilities in Southeast Asia, particularly given uh, some of the challenges that my colleagues have, have discussed with you all, um, the challenges and the opportunities that exist uh, at this day and age. Thank you uh, very much, Congresswoman Spanberger. And as a retired Foreign Service officer, I agree that that's a, a, a very topical uh, and important question. First of all, um, uh, as I stated in my statement, um, we need to get our ambassadors out there. Yeah. Ambassadors are the people on the ground who are in the best place to identify opportunities and to cooperate with like-minded partner and allied embassies in pursuing those opportunities. I did that as ambassador with Vietnam, particularly with the Australian and Japanese uh, embassies, well before the tri overall trilateral relationship among us started to develop, um, well before we um, revived the Quad. So um, ambassadors are critical in, in getting us to um, identify the opportunities and coordinating interagency as well. It's much easier to coordinate the interagency in an embassy than it is in Washington. So um, uh, I think ambassadors can be, can be very agile and they need to be encouraged to do so by the State Department. Secondly- and, and, Mr. Ambassador, if I could just interrupt you right there. So I'm a former CIA case officer, so I'm very familiar with what you mean by the, the interagency. Could you just give a, a, a little bit of an explanation in terms of particularly given the challenges that exist 
in Southeast Asia, the real value of having all the folks at the embassy, kind of who they are, the, the color and the flavor, um, why that matters so much to have the ambassador leading those discussions. Because the, the ambassador is the representative of the personal representative of the, of the president in that country. And the ambassador is really the best person uh, to uh, do what's necessary to encourage separate agencies housed in the embassy to work together, to cooperate, to do what we need to do, to come together as a country team and, uh, and get done what we need to get done. And I think um, that we did that um, in getting the Vietnamese to, uh, when I was in Vietnam, getting the Vietnamese to agree to join TPP talks. Uh, we did it in encouraging the Vietnamese to uh, expand military to military cooperation. And we did it with the Vietnamese uh, in conjunction with AID and our CDC office in Hanoi to increase uh, Vietnamese capability to respond to pandemics, for example. Mm -hmm. In my case, it's H5N1. Uh, but um, all of these are, and to pursue commercial opportunities as well. Um, we did that with GE, we did it with Boeing, we did it with, uh, with Dow Chemical. Um, all of those require uh, whole of embassy efforts. And as I say, it's a lot easier to coordinate in an embassy than it is in Washington. That's right. It's a lot easier to take initiatives as well. And you've served at the Department of Defense as well. And, and I think arguably the U.S. military has, has a stronger track record for really investing in, in training its personnel. Uh, and certainly that also uh, Congress is involved in those decision makings as they relate to, to funding. Um, but I, I think what would be your comments related to if the department were more consistently able to invest in the training of its foreign and civil service officers? How would that better enable stronger diplomatic engagement in, in regions across the world, but particularly in Southeast Asia? The department has minimal training opportunities for mid-level and senior officers, and they need to be expanded. Um, uh, mid-level foreign service officers get most of their training on the job. Fortunately, there are dedicated, strong uh, officers in the foreign service who are willing to mentor younger officers. But that, and it's, that's, uh, that's uh, significant, but it's not sufficient. The State Department needs to establish a training float. It needs to expand its, the number of personnel so that it can train people more effectively. And they need to do it not only in, uh, in terms of language and area studies, they need to do it in terms of strategy. They need to give foreign service officers a good, strong background in American diplomatic history. We have a great tradition of diplomacy in this country, and our foreign service officers need to be more aware of it. Finally, I, I think we need, and this is a, a, a prominent issue, we need, to, we need to strengthen diversity in the State Department. We, in Southeast Asia, we need to show our best face to the Southeast Asians, and that has to be a diverse face. Thank you very much, Ambassador Scheer, uh, and Mr. Chairman, thank you for letting me run over uh, with, with, uh, with my time. I yield back. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let me now recognize the gentlelady from North Carolina, Congresswoman Manning, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Barra and Ranking Member Chabot for holding this very important hearing. And thank you to all our witnesses for appearing today. Clearly, Southeast Asia is critically, uh, critically important for the United States in light of the um, intense competition we are seeing with China. Um, I, I want to go back to a topic that we've been discussing at great length, and that is the terrible blunder that it was for the Trump administration to walk away from the TTP. And I wonder, Ambassador Scheer, if you could talk to us about whether you think the admission to China, because we've talked about their application, would the admission of China to the CPTPP weaken the ability of the CPTTP to accomplish many of the things that we were hoping to accomplish when the Obama administration worked so hard to create the TTP. Ambassador Scheer. All right, sorry, Congresswoman. Um, uh, you broke up on me a little, but um, uh, I understand your question to be related to our rejoining of the TPP and the uh, 
the uh, awkwardness that Chinese uh, bid for membership in that has caused us. Um, I, I, my sense is that um, uh, Chinese application for membership in the TPP has placed particularly the Japanese in a tough spot. Um, and my guess is that um, given the pro likely lack of consensus within the TPP itself on Chinese membership, that the Japanese will delay a decision on that. That should give us a window of opportunity for trying to restore the, um, the uh, uh, prestige and the authority we've lost on this process um, and consider rejoining the TPP. Great, thank you. I want to ask about a different area. Um, and Ambassador Shear, this is for you also. I hope you can still hear me. Uh, many countries in the region, including Indonesia and the Philippines, have faced significant challenges from the spread of religious extremism and terrorism. What level of threat to the region and to the United States does this constitute? And how uh, is the United States cooperating with our partners to reduce extremism in Southeast Asia and any attendant risk? Well, I think uh, terrorism rep continues to represent a serious threat uh, throughout Southeast Asia particularly in the Philippines, Indonesia, Singapore, and Malaysia. Um, we have established strong cooperative relationships with each of these countries, um, both uh, uh, within the intelligence community and um, with DOD and the State Department. And I'm sure that uh, even as our strategic priorities shift, that, um, that we will continue close cooperation on counterterrorism with these countries. Um, uh, I was in Kuala Lumpur from 2005 to 2008. And I have to say that uh, the closest, the two closest elements of our uh, relationship with Malaysia were the trade relationship and the counter-terror relationship. So uh, I'm confident that we can carry through. And of course, um, we've had a presence in the Philippines uh, conducting counter-terror operations uh, in the past. And I, I think that has, um, that has uh, strongly enhanced our um, uh, say in Manila on the need to preserve this relationship, not only um, in terms of counterterrorism, but across the board, particularly in defense relations. Thank you. Ms. Miller, I want to talk a little bit about this supply chain issue. Actually, I want to talk about uh, the companies that are moving out of China uh, due to trade instability, sanctions, or other geopolitical concerns. How have our partners in Southeast Asia benefited from this development? And what can we in the United States do to encourage more companies and industries to move out of China to, to some of the uh, other countries we've been talking about? Thank you very much, Representative Manning, for your question. Um, Southeast Asian countries have benefited from supply chain shifts, some countries more than others, uh, Vietnam, Malaysia, the Philippines, and to a certain degree, Indonesia. Um, have become attractive destinations. Um, all of these countries, to varying degrees, um, face uh, challenges in building out their infrastructure to absorb some of the additional investment from U.S. companies um, in building human capacity and in strengthening their overall supply chain security measures to be fully integrated with the global economy. I think one of the ways that we can help with this is by reengaging, as we've been discussing, on CPTPP and helping to build strong business environments that provide um, good market access for U.S. companies um, and strong legal and investment frameworks. And um, we can also work with our partners in the region to engage them in some of the important conversations the Biden administration is having about overall supply chain security in light of, uh, in particular, some of the shocks to the system from COVID-19, um, as well as China's rise. Thanks so much. Um, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Right. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Yes. Chairman. Yep. 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 Yes, Mr. Shabbat, uh, as a ranking member of the committee, I just want to clarify for the record, uh, the previous questioner uh, accurately uh, stated that uh, President Trump pulled out of TPP, but I would note for the record that both candidate Trump and candidate Hillary Clinton both said that's what they would have done if they won. Trump won, Hillary did not. So he pulled out, she would have done the same thing according to her own statement, just to set the record. Great. I yield back. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chabot. And I really do want to 
let me let me take a moment to make a, a closing statement. Certainly, we'll give um, the ranking member a chance to make a closing statement. I want to thank the, the witnesses um, you know, for emphasizing the importance of Southeast Asia, the importance of ASEAN. You know, some of the, the, the leading countries there are Indonesia, the Philippines, um, Vietnam, obviously Singapore. And you know, we really do have some, some opportunities coming up with the ASEAN summits this fall. I think the administration can, can show leadership as, as they engage. Um, and, and I think Congress has a real role here. I think one of the witnesses talked about the importance of members traveling to the region. You know, one of my last trips pre-pandemic, including a, a, a co-delta, Singapore, Malaysia, and the Philippines, we had a chance to visit some of our special operators there. And really, um, you know, ma many of these countries, Malaysia in particular, rarely get co-dels. And you know, the access we got for this young, struggling democracy um, it, it's incredibly important. So, yeah, it's my hope as, as chair, um, hopefully sooner than, than later, to, to lead a CODEL um, to the region, to Indonesia, to Vietnam, and, and, and elsewhere in the region. Because, again, I think it is important at this particular moment in time for us to emphasize um, that the United States sees ASEAN, sees the region as just not a, a pawn in a, a, a power competition, but as a, a, a real area of opportunity and growth and um, engagement. So with that, again, I wanna thank the, um, the witnesses for you know, emphasizing the region. And let me give the ranking member a, a moment to, to make any closing statements. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will be brief. Uh, you know, going forward, uh, getting our partnership with Southeast Asia right is gonna be absolutely critical. Um, Southeast Asia and the Indo-Pacific as, uh, as a whole really are only going to grow in importance uh, over the next generation, both uh, in their own right. Uh, uh, it, it's got over half the world's population there, as we know, uh, and because China obviously is located there, our, our chief uh, geopolitical competitor into the foreseeable future. Um, with that in mind, I think this has been a, a very good hearing. I thought all three of the panelists were, were excellent and did a great job in answering our, our questions. And I think the discussion that we had shows that Congress, uh, or at least this subcommittee, uh, really does uh, care about uh, and is truly invested in our relationship uh, with Southeast Asia. And that's important uh, because as we seek to convince the region that America is a reliable and lasting partner, and that's uh, particularly challenging uh, in the wake of Afghanistan, which was a, uh, uh, I think, a, a blunder of epic proportions, uh, that it, it's uh, substantive engagement like we've seen today uh, that are going to really demonstrate uh, that we mean what we say. So, Mr. Chairman, thank you for holding this uh, hearing, and thank you to all three of our uh, panelists who, as I said, I thought did an excellent job. I yield back. Thank you. And uh, again, I want to thank our witnesses and the members who participated in this very important virtual hearing. With that, the hearing is adjourned and you have a virtual gavel banging down. So thank you, everyone. Be well. Thank you.